Once upon a time. <laughs> How many times any of you that have dealt with children or even remember from being a child, hearing that start to a story, even made up stories, because inevitably as a kid, you go to make up a story, it was always once upon a time. How many times? Once, it says, upon a time. Well, <clears throat> the question I have today was, or is, when was your once upon a time? I've been told, and I have no grounds to dispute it, I guess, I've been told that everyone has at least one book in them. Now, whether or not you can write that book, I don't know if I can or not. I fancy writing a book, but I've started <laughs> several and uh, have yet to complete one. But I don't know if I can write a story about myself with any degree of dignity. But uh, yeah, that, that's the story, that everybody has at least one book in them. And if I were, if I were reading a book, whether you wrote it or someone else wrote it about you, if I were reading a book about your adventure, your, your spiritual journey, what would the next sentence be? Now, yes, I am aware that most stories or most books for adults don't begin with Once Upon a Time. We're not reading Robin Hood or um, whatever. But anyway, um, but I'm sure we all know how... I, well, actually, I'm not. I'm not sure that we all know how to how to begin that story or actually where it began or where it began if you are thinking not we all know where life began and we've had this conversation a few times and I think for myself anyway I don't remember anything before about three I have some vague images that might have been before three and I know that just because of pictures in my mom's and dad's old picture albums. But without those pictures and without having seen those pictures again and again over the years, would I remember those situations? Probably not, just from my own memory. So there are those things that spur memories and, and maybe even help you develop memories because even looking at the pictures, the memories that I have of some events probably aren't as accurate as I would like to think they are. But I digress. I don't know if, if we really do know if our, uh, how to begin that story or where it began as far as where did it really, we, we can all relate our story of coming to some knowledge and making the decision to be baptized and what church we went to or fellowship group and that kind of stuff or where we met. But I don't know where it, that journey actually begins. Maybe, maybe that's at birth as well. I don't know. So you are all such disappointments. Now that doesn't feel very good, does it? And, I, and that's the reason I use that line, just to make that, just to make that point. Matthew twenty two forty, 40, Micah 6, 8, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. These are some places in Scripture, just a few, that... And of course, Matthew twenty-two forty 40 is the, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord expect of you except to do just love mercy and walk humbly with your God? And of course, we all know that Ecclesiastes 12, 13 is this is the conclusion of the whole matter. This is the whole duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments, right? So this is just three different places where the Bible gives us, I think, a where it encapsulates or maybe snapshots what level of expectation there is of us as human beings. So it does serve to do that. Um, an expectation from our maker could be summed up a little bit in, in those few verses and, and many more, but those are just the ones that come to mind. Now perhaps I could make the argument that if you don't know the next sentence, if I were telling your, or I were reading your spiritual journey story, and it began once upon a time, if you, sitting here today, can't 
don't have a clear idea of what that next sentence would be as far as where does this story begin? Where did it all start? If you don't know that next sentence, then maybe you don't fully understand your story. Perhaps we, perhaps we don't have a writable, is that a word, writable, answer to why we are where we find ourselves today. Why we are where we find ourselves today. Now, yes, I will echo the sentiment that here in this group we are somewhat like a family. With that being said, I think I have a reasonable understanding for most, well, it's a small group today, so maybe everyone here, I have at least a reasonable understanding of how you came to be at Crossroads Church of God Seventh Day. I, I know those stories. Maybe not intimately or in great, great detail, but if I went around the room, I think I could at least have a highlight reel of how you ended up attending here at Crossroads Church of God Seventh Day. So that's that's not the the how or the why of my investigation. That's 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 not what I'm inquiring. Um, and it's a rhetorical in inquiry because I'm not <laughs> expecting you to raise your hand and tell me. But anyway, there are there are different approaches as parents. When you become a parent, you develop your own parenting style, right? And I guess a lot of that is formulated from your experience growing up. You, you carry a lot of that with you. This is the way my parents did it. Maybe not all the things, but some of it for sure. So there are different approaches as parents. But for me, I will say one of the aspects of my childhood is that I was not shielded, shielded from the, I was not shielded from the reality of death. No matter how far back my memories go, I don't ever remember being shielded from that reality as a child. One of the earliest memories I can think about, and I don't know exactly how old I was, but I know my dad discovered our neighbor in the yard, his yard, still clutching a hammer, if I remember the story correctly, my dad can tell it to you. His name was Mr. Hughes, which was no relation to us. My mom, is her maiden name is Hughes, but this was just neighbors that happened to be Hughes's, and this man worked. I can, I can remember his voice and kind of remember his face, but I was really young when he died of a heart attack in his yard. I think he was putting up some, maybe some something for some grapevines or something. Um, so that's that's dealing with with death really close to home because it's right across the, the gravel road that we lived on. Um, I know that because of the age gap, obviously, and the age gap is because there were so many kids in my dad's family, and dad's near the bottom, so there were brothers and sisters much older than him, so dad has nephews and nieces not much younger than him. So, And because of that, I had older cousins, right? So I know one of dad's older brothers had a son who almost died. Both of his sons almost died in a car accident, and one of them eventually did die in a car accident. I can barely remember him. I remember him and my brother playing chess at the kitchen table. That's one of the memories I have. And I remember his funeral to a degree. Uh, I also had an older cousin who uh, I believe stepped on a landmine or something in the Vietnam War. Um, and, and I remember his funeral vaguely because then that's one of the first funerals I ever went to with a 21 gun salute and it scared the out of me. Um, yeah, there's just, there's just, there, there was a bomb shelter uh, back in the day, back in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and, and probably going on back to the 50s when I think this was a bomb shelter that had been turned into maybe more of a storage facility underground, and this was in Baldi, the town where I grew up. There were some kids playing, and this was in 72, I think, so I would have been five. My mom and dad had some really good friends that lived just across the street, and two of their kids were in a group of kids who went down into this bomb shelter, and unbeknownst to them, there was a gas leak 
they pulled the string for the light and it shook the entire county <laughs> and blew these kids to smithereens. I remember that. Mm. I remember that funeral because it was one of the saddest ones I'd ever been to because I obviously knew the mom and dad. I was a kid, but I still was very acquainted because they were friends of my parents and how terribly sad. Um, so yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't shielded from the reality of death. But the other, the flip side of that is that I was also an uncle at six years old. Uh, three times an uncle by the time I was 12 or 13. Uh, so <clears throat> the circle was evident from a young age that this is life and this is death. And it, yeah, so again, the circle is evident from an early age. Now, it's crazy how long that span looks in young eyes, right? When you're, when you're young and you think about the circle, it, you, I don't know if circle of life was even a thing back then. It was a thing, but I don't know if that term was. But the span of life from cradle to grave seemed like, except for those exceptions of young people tragically dying, seemed like, oh, gosh, I'm a kid. I'm going to live to be 100 years old. It's a long, long, long time. But, <laughs> yeah, but then um, I had an older cousin who had a infant son, I think he was three months old, who died from SIDS. At, the, at that time, it was still called crib death for the most part, but it was named sudden infant death syndrome. But, and I say that because I remember, I don't know exactly how old I was, but I do remember being at the funeral home in a coffin not much longer than this podium is wide. And it was impactful. It was... Uh, yeah, it was very impactful. And I know this is a morbid, this is morbid subject matter, but my point is the journey. And that's just some of the things that this kid had in that mix of things that when he became an adolescent or a teenager, and I believe somewhere in there is where the real journey started, but that's, uh, that could be argued, I guess. Where you, your, your, your young life, you're, you're connecting these dots to form your view of the world and its, and its contents. And it doesn't take long to start realizing that there are questions that need answers. Because this doesn't last forever. No matter how young you are, how long that span seems, the realization is in there that this doesn't go on forever. This is not infinite. There is an end of the road, right? So it doesn't take long to start having questions that need answers. Now, if you're like me, maybe you saw some, some pamphlets <laughs> when you were young that kind of fed into that too. You know, the ones where you know, somebody would hand you, you'd see it laying somewhere, if you die tonight, or you know, all these different things about, yeah, would you go to heaven or hell, or is always preaching about some scary something to try to scare your socks off. But, even if I am no longer concerned with an eternal hellfire and torment, I have to stand here and honestly say that I am still trying to avoid being dead forever. That's part of my motivation. I don't want to be dead forever. I know that I will be dead. I just don't, <laughs> I don't want to be dead forever. But I guess once I'm dead, that's no longer a concern, is it? Yeah, that's only for the living. Now, you've heard my case many times, most likely, uh, from the early experiences with religion about not having the ability, most churches I were, was in didn't really have the ability to tell me a lot of things to look forward to except for staying out of hell. They couldn't make heaven look that good, but they could make hellfire look really scary. Now, I do, we do, think that we have a better understanding of the reward of the saved, right? We believe that we do. But I, I cannot say and won't say that this was part of the original motivation because I didn't have any understanding really of the reward of the saved except I ain't in hell. But with that, 
I'm going to turn to a scripture in Philippians chapter 4. And we all know that there's one very memorable verse, which they all should be, I suppose. In chapter 4, it's that through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I'm going to read the first nine verses of Philippians chapter 4, and I'm reading from the NIV. This is a closing appeal for the steadfast, for steadfastness and unity from Paul to the people of Philippi. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, verse 1, chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Plead, I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Synocte to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Now, to me, there is thanksgiving in your prayer, and there is thanksgiving in what you expect from your prayer. Present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends, the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, it's giving us some dots to connect, isn't it? If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. The God of peace will be with you. That is a prescription that I want to take. Because the longer I live and the more I see, the more I encounter, experience, the more I need, want, for the peace of God to be with me. The more I want to see the peace of God be with you. Because it's just, the world can be, it can be a very hard place, even as an adult. Now, this may seem like an odd place to insert this passage of Scripture, Philippians 4. As it is with most script, Scriptures, though, there's plenty that, could, plenty that could be unpacked, even just from those nine verses. But to my knowledge, to my knowledge, which isn't that extensive, I guess, this is the only place where the book of life is mentioned outside of Revelation. 66 books, and the other 65 mentioned the book of life <laughs> once. Yeah, and maybe someday I'll get to a point of saying why well, that is interesting to me, but I'm still working on that, still coming up with that answer. But part of Paul's point here, I believe, is that if we plan to, if we plan to eternally live together in peace and that is our plan right we're like a family here and we have brothers and sisters out there we want to live with God for eternity in peace together or maybe you want to live eternally with God <laughs> separate from this this group here I don't know but I think we do I think we want to live together in peace eternally and I think Paul's pitch here is if, if, if that's our goal, then we should certainly be practicing it here. 
with what I've already said in your mind, if it can stay there, if you were if you were told today that your name is not yet written, would you be disappointed? If an authority, an angel, the voice of God, whatever it is, came to you and said, your name, Freddie, isn't there. Your name is not yet written. Yeah, disappointment for sure. Um, now, maybe we are, maybe we are getting closer to the motivator. When I said heaven wasn't made to look all that enticing, but hell looked really bad. So, so what living right had to do, or what the reward was for living right, maybe was kind of hazy or, or foggy. So that wasn't a motivator. I really want that. I really want that. The motivator, I guess, if I'm being honest, was not being dead forever and certainly not being burning forever and being gouged with a pitchfork and, you know, the kind of things that you're taught to believe as a kid sometimes. But, yeah, the disappointment, maybe a little, maybe a little closer to our once upon a time beginning. So <clears throat> give me an example, and I don't, again, rhetorical, not asking for a show of hands here, but give me an example of a time, any time, when you have sought or when you have ran after disappointment. Boy, my, my disappointment meter is running low. I need to go out and find, you know, I don't, I doubt anybody here ever wakes up saying, well, I hope I can disappoint myself or someone else today. And I say that in jest, brethren, but there is a real avoidance of disappointment, isn't there? It's a motivator. No one wants to be looked at and say, you are such a disappointment. Well, thank you. I accomplished that today. So yeah, I think, I think that does skirt a little closer, at least for me, to my next sentence after Once Upon a Time when we're talking about spiritual journeys. I hope I can disappoint myself or someone else today. I suggest that it must most commonly start with parents and or grandparents, right? That, that avoidance of, of disappointment. Because if you respect your mom and dad, or you love and respect your grandparents, that is the last people, as a kid, do you want to hear those words from? You've disappointed me. We don't want to disappoint anybody. But the people who are big as all outdoors, you do not and try to avoid, not at all costs, because I've done some stupid stuff as a kid that I knew was going to <laughs> disappoint my parents. But you don't, you don't seek after it. You don't run after it, right? Now, I think it most commonly starts with parents and her grandparents. Now, now granted, and this is this is kind of a kind of pointed, I guess. But some folks attempt to avoid the concept altogether by becoming obstinate, by becoming rebellious. I don't care if I disappoint my parents, my parents, 
What have I ever done for me? You know how you know how it can be, right? So becoming obstinate and rebellious, I'm an island. I'm an island. I could not care less what other people think. And I guarantee you, as I stand here and speak to you, and as you sit there and listen, you know someone. <laughs> Maybe more than one someone. Or you've at least experienced those kind of attitudes. The people that are, they, 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 they revel in being a rebel. Ah, care I do my thing, boy. Nobody tell me nothing. So I think a lot of times, and maybe there's all kinds of reasons for that. People go through some stuff, right? But there are some people that choose to be <laughs> obstinate and rebellious. I don't care. Maybe even God. I don't care. Who needs God? What are y'all this religion junk? What's this all? I don't need that. Yeah, connect those dots and see, <laughs> see what picture appears at the end. And the end will be. We know that. In a normal world, we begin at infancy to, to learn acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Now, some of that is for safety, some of that is for decency, and if we're honest, maybe some is for appearances. I'm maybe a little bit guilty of that as a parent and adopting my parenting style, but I have to tell you, I never thought it was a bad thing. It never felt bad. And it happened more than once. And this is not bragging on Linda and me. It's just, but when someone comes to your table at a restaurant and says, you've got some of the best behaved kids. Just want to, just felt like I had this, well, thank you. And that's having well behaved kids. I mean, my kids weren't sitting there shaking in terror because mom and dad were there. They were just taught from infancy what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behavior. And one of those unacceptable behaviors is do not embarrass me in Walmart or in a restaurant because there will be <laughs> consequences and repercussions, right? Yeah, but it, it was never. I never considered it a bad thing, and I, I, I thought it was a compliment for people to say, you've got some well-behaved kids. And, you know, would I do everything exactly the same if I could start over being a parent? Probably not. But now I stated normal world, right? Maybe we are still normal for our day. I've lost track. Remember how weary we grew, or at least I did, from that phrase, the new normal, during the pandemic, this is the new normal. This is the new. Well, normal is becoming new so many times I can't keep up. I don't know what it is. So is this the new normal? Maybe it is. Maybe we're still normal for our day. From my view, viewpoint, however, we have to wonder, or I have to wonder, is disappointing, is disappointing parents or grandparents still a thing? You know, I've, I haven't been on the bus for a while, and I, and I, I love most of those kids, I'm, I don't know, and God knows how my heart feels about most of those kids. Maybe all of them, but I love some a little more than the others. And kind of sad that I want, as much as it drove me crazy, already having some feelings about not being on that bus next year. But anyway, it is what it is. But yeah, is, is disappointing parents or grandparents still a thing? And I, you know, I'm not sure how serious a consideration that is anymore with kids or really if the expectation is all that high <laughs> when you look at some of the parents you're like not not looking at the parents and, and judging them by their appearances but the way they conduct <laughs> their parenting it's like yeah is, is what's the expectation of your child anyway thinking about how long that span of life looked in the in in my young eyes it makes one wonder which has which has really changed more, the world or the way we see it with older, more um, mature or experienced eyes. I probably know the consensus in the room, but I think most of us would say the world has changed more than our perspective. But I can say, I will, I will stand here and say that I was pretty fond of the 80s. 
And even when I watch things from the 80s, music videos, we were sitting at home one night and, and went on to a thing that had a, a video, and it's like, we're going to turn it. Well, then another video came on, and it's like, yeah, you remember that song? And you remember the places you were and things you were doing and listening to that song, what kind of stereo you had in your car and all these different, all these different things. So I was, I was pretty fond of the 80s, which could not have looked very nice to seniors of the day. <laughs> these people are crazy. Can you imagine? It's hard for me to imagine now what a 70, 50, 60, 70 year old person thought of the punk rock craze and the spiked hair and the, just, uh, just the craziness that was it's like, we're going to hell in a handbasket. Look at these people. Look at this young generation. So really, things are going to change. We don't want things not to change. We want things to change for the better, but we can't stop the flow of time, right? So what changes the most, the world or just the way we perceive it? I will say there is freedom and liberation in another pop phrase or a pop culture phrase. You do you. You do you. Not basing every action on the, re on the reaction or the opinions of others. However, I can live with that phrase. But my job is you do you with your name still written. Okay? That's my job. You do you, but keep your name written, and hopefully it's, it's written, right? Where is the next dot now? Thinking about it that way. You do you with your name still written. If me doing me, if me doing me, keeps my name out of the book. Either I have to be okay with that. Either I'm okay with that status or me doing me has to be modified. That's my job. By all accounts, by all accounts, it is certainly your choice to make. But you are informed. Just know your risk, know your risk, and own the results, okay? Modern term, adulting. You know, but adulting is like, <laughs> seeing somebody really actually adulting is like catching sight of the Bigfoot or the Yeti. Yeah, we think we're adulting, and then we act like children sometimes. I tend to believe that the learning the learning of acceptable and unacceptable behavior played a role in the sentence that follows once upon a time in your spiritual story. Now I'm always going to go back to who would you be without the influences because it's, it's always a question for me. But then we talk about that and the other side of that conversation is I had to I had to have the path that I've had in order to be where I am today. So I guess the influences have been okay. You and I are trying to prove something, brethren, to ourselves, to someone else, and maybe to God. Trying to prove something. Continuing in, in chapter 4, as I wrap this up, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any, every, any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Can you, when you're connecting the dots or when you're, you know, going on your journey, you need to ask the questions sometimes of yourself. Can you be full and feel the hunger of another? Can you be full and still feel hunger? Can you have plenty and still feel the need of another? I say... Not, 
those verses and those things of, of being full and, and yet feeling hunger, and I, I don't, there's plenty of application for what Paul said there. But I'm using this application to be full but still feel someone else's hunger, to have plenty and still feel somebody else, and I mean feel it, somebody else's need. That does not coexist in my mind with obstinance and rebellion. If you, could, if you could not care less what other people think, it's hard to be compassionate to someone who's having need or being hungry or poor, whatever it is. It's hard for that to coexist with obstinance or rebellion. With Christ, all things are possible. Now down to verse 19. And these are in the middle of the... And my God, and may, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So I guess my whole point in this little message is know what makes you tick. Know what makes you tick. Know the sentence that follows once upon a time in your spiritual story. 